Justice without mercy is cruelty, but mercy without justice is the mother of immorality. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. My faithful, if we look for the central thought of today's liturgy, I believe it is an invitation to practice mercy. While the Gospel invites us to meekness in words, in the epistle, St. Peter clearly insists on the merciful charity we should have for our neighbor. Beloved, says St. Peter, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another, being lovers of the brotherhood, merciful, modest, humble, not rendering evil for evil, not railing for railing, but contrariwise, blessing. For unto these you are called, that you may inherit a blessing. And you know our Lord also told us in the Sermon on the Mount, be merciful as your heavenly Father is merciful. Mercy is therefore one of the essential characteristic of the Christian and even, we can say, his proper characteristic. For just as God's distinctive trait is to be constantly merciful and inclined to forgiveness, as we say in the Liturgy of the Dead, so the distinctive trait of the Christian <clears throat> must be to imitate God's mercy in his goodness and charity. However, we are currently facing a serious problem. In our society, and unfortunately, even in the church, the term mercy is used to justify unacceptable innovations, both in the doctrinal and moral order. In the name of mercy, there is an exaggerated openness to other religions through a false ecumenism, so that conversion to the Catholic faith is no longer required. In the name of mercy, the demands of the Gospels of the Gospel are lowered. Adultery and the sin of homosexuality are relativized in such a way that it is accepted to give communion to remarried divorcees, and that the vice against nature is almost recognized as something good. We are really facing a problem. And you know, the key to this problem, it seems to me, lies in the true notion of mercy, as expounded by St. Thomas Aquinas in his Summa Theologica. So let us see what this great saint tells us about mercy as we should practice it. And this will allow, this will, this will allow us to understand what false mercy, which we must avoid at all costs, consists of. In what does mercy consist? St. Thomas defines it this way in his treatise on charity. As Augustine says, mercy or pity is compassion in our heart for another's unhappiness or misery, by which we are compelled to help if we are able to, for it's called misericordia, the Latin term, from the fact that one has a saddened heart, miserum cor, in Latin, the saddened heart over the unhappiness of another. So in short, to be merciful is to have a heart that bows to the misery of others to remedy it. The merciful person is the one 
who see some pain, some unhappiness, and want to remedy it, to erase this pain. And this is very important. And in asking whether mercy is a virtue, so is it good to be merciful? St. Thomas makes a fundamental distinction. He says that the compassion by which one grieves for the suffering and misery of others can be twofold. First, it can be a movement of the sensibility, a feeling, a sentiment. It is a feeling by which one suffers from the misfortune of others. For example, I witness someone's pain and it moves me deeply so that I want to console them. A feeling. But it can be, says St. Thomas, also a movement of the will. This is not anymore a feeling. This is something more spiritual. According to St. Augustine, this movement of the will is virtuous when mercy is practiced <clears throat> in such a way that justice is spared, either by helping the indigent or by forgiving the repentant. And here we have an essential element for there to be true mercy. Justice must be preserved. And St. Thomas makes it clear that the sentiment, the feeling of mercy, must not influence the decisions that are made, because otherwise justice is lacking. Now let us take three examples to understand better this notion. It would be a mistake for a judge, moved by compassion and pity for a guilty person, to issue a favorable sentence when the facts clearly show his guilt and that he deserves to be punished. Sounds logical. In the same way, the mother of a family who always excuses her child and never applies a healthy punishment to him practices a misunderstood mercy. The consequence will be that she does not help him to correct himself and keeps him in the vice. When the mother is always, always giving permission to his child, uh, he, she is making a little monster, a little monster, because she is allowing all the vices in his child. She needs to correct him. It would be a wrong mercy. Another case could be the priest, us, who in order to avoid causing sadness to his faithful, does not tell them the salutary truth, does not speak to them about sin, purgatory, or hell. We would like to tell you always nice things about heaven, about virtue, about the gift of the Holy Ghost, but sometimes we need to tell you the reality, the reality of sin, of purgatory, and hell also. In all these cases, the feeling of mercy would be opposed to virtue because it is opposed to justice. Justice requires the judge to pass a just sentence, just as it requires the mother to correct her children and the pastor to preach the truth in its fullness, and not only truth that flatter the ear. In the commentary, on St. Matthew, St. Thomas uses a forceful expression that takes up perfectly what we have just said. Justice without mercy is cruelty, but mercy without justice is the mother of immorality. Justice without mercy usually is too harsh, but mercy without justice opens the way to all kinds of disorder, of sins. So I guess now we understand better what the false mercy we must avoid consists of. False mercy is mercy without justice. And in the, in, in the order of sin, this lack of justice is manifested by permissiveness, 
by not demanding the conversion of the sinner. It overlooks the need for conversion, for a man's response to the divine heart that bends over him to remedy his misery. True mercy wants to remedy misery. It wants to erase it, to bring the sinner out of his sin. False mercy does not remedy anything. It only leaves the sinner in his lamentable state. This is the big problem of false mercy. It doesn't change anything for the sinner. He's leaving it in his lamentable situation and by consequence in his way to hell. Of course, because sin is the way to eternal damnation. To help us understand you know, the misdeeds of this false mercy, let us apply its spirit to some gospel sins. First, the case of the woman taken in flagrant adultery. You remember this case? St. John tells us about it in his chapter 8. The Jews bring this woman to Jesus because according to the law, she was to be stoned. Jesus answered them, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. You remember what happened? They all go away, one after the other. Finally, he finds himself alone with the woman. Jesus strengthens up and says to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, sir. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go your way, and from no one, do not sin again. This conclusion of our Lord is very clear. Go your way, mercy, I forgive you your sin. But from no one, do not sin again. Conversion. You need to convert, you need to change. You need to not sin again, to have a new life. And this is true mercy. Forgiveness, but call to conversion, to change. You know, if our Lord had been moved by false mercy, he would have said to the woman, go your way, your sins are forgiven. And do not worry too much about your sin. It's not a big deal. It's not important. No, it's very clear. It's a big deal. Sin is a big deal. He's hurting our Lord, his heart. He's a very big deal. He, he died on the cross for sin. So he doesn't want us to sin. He wants us to convert, to change. Do not sin again. Another example. Let us look at the parable of the prodigal son. Remember this boy, the gospel tells us, squandered his inheritance, wasting it away from home by living lustfully. And finally, full of repentance, he returns to his father and asks for forgiveness. Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. You remember how the father receives him. This is so nice, this scene of the gospel. You can see the, the, the heart of our God in action. After running to meet him and embracing him wholeheartedly, he said, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And get the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. You know, if that father, our God, had been filled with fair, false mercy, he would have said to his son, Okay, I forgive you. So now you can live again and go back to your sin. Sounds absurd, but this is exactly the spirit of false mercy. I forgive you, so now sin again. You know, this false mercy leads us to believe that there can be divine forgiveness without conversion, without change on our part. And this is exactly, you know, what happens when we pretend to be able to give communion to people 
who live in a sinful situation, such as remarried divorcees. Of course, you know, as priests, we have to face often very difficult situations. We know it's not easy, easy uh, to change our life sometimes, but it's necessary. We cannot receive forgiveness if we don't, we don't change our life. True mercy asks us to go away from our sin, to really come to our God, to convert. This is necessary. This false mercy is not real mercy, but you know, a sentimentalism that becomes an accomplice to the sin of others. This is the conclusion. False mercy is an accomplice to the sin of others. This is not charity at all. Because charity wants to change, change souls. Carry them to God, to the cross of Jesus, to the Eucharist, so they can go to heaven. They don't, the charitable people don't leave people in their sin. They want to change the sinners. So, my dear faithful, you know, it is important for us to have a clear idea about these notions. Because, really, it is the great principle the false principle that is invoked today to change the church, its doctrine and its moral. It's necessary to be merciful. So, God is merciful, so you don't need to convert. You don't need to be a Catholic. You can be a Protestant, you can be a Buddhist, you can be, I don't know, an atheist. Doesn't matter because God is good, God is merciful, so you don't need to change. Hmm. You can live in sin and go to communion because God is good, God is merciful. It's not like that. Of course, our God is merciful. Our God is charity. He died on a cross for us. It's obvious that his charity is merciful. But he wants us to change. And now what we are doing, what the modernism is doing, is changing the religion with this fake mercy. So we need to have very clear ideas to know, to not fall in this trap, in this trick of the devil, to falsificate the true notion of mercy. Oh, my dear faithful, yes, it's necessary to be merciful. Of course, we need to be merciful. This is the proper characteristic of the Christian. But let it be a true mercy, not a fake one. Let it be the mercy of the sacred heart of Jesus, that of the immaculate heart of Mary, which is ready to do anything, anything, to save souls and pull them out of their sins. And let us always remember this sentence of St. Thomas, which sheds light on this question. Justice without mercy is cruelty, but mercy without justice is the mother of immorality. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.